Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. I'm Sharon Peterson, and our scripture this morning is from Matthew 25, 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The bridesmaids who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the time. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Well, this is our fourth week in our series on time. And if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, uh, you may want to go back uh, and, and watch some of the previous messages. I'll reference them as we go along. But just a quick recap, as we started by talking about measuring our days and making each day count. Uh, then we talked about maximizing the moment, paying attention to each moment that God gives us and and asking, what is this moment requiring of me in response? And then our third week, we talked about making room for margin. Last week, we talked about how when we make margin, it takes Sabbath time. That's how God renews and restores our soul. And today, we come to our last uh, lesson, remembering the end. And, and I just want to remind you, if you haven't been here and didn't pick up one, we have these little timers as a way of kind of helping you to measure time, but also to set aside time for prayer and conversation with God. You can pick them up uh, in the back of the church if you want. I think we have a few left. So remembering the end. I don't know if you've had this conversation with anyone. I, I feel like I have it just about every week, but it could be that's because I'm a pastor. But maybe you've at least had the thought, because every week I have a conversation with someone who asks me, Pastor, are we living in the end time? And when people ask this question, I mean, they can point to all number of things that are taking place in our world right now. They can look at the social upheaval and unrest, the fracturing of institutions that we've relied upon. They, they might point to, you know, the, the global pandemic and the way that it's changed our world. Like, you know, when the Big Ten canceled football, that surely is a sign of the apocalypse, right? You know? And, or, or, or they might say, well, but, but look at the global warming and all these, you know, storms that are coming through. I mean, just in the last 10 days, we've had wildfires blazing out of control in California. You had a, a derecho, which I didn't even know that word until it passed through and struck and tore up so many farms and homes and businesses in Iowa. And just in the last week, we had twin tropical storms and hurricanes hitting Louisiana and Texas. I mean, surely, people say, it can't get much worse than this. This must be the end times. Now, the end times have been something that, have been that has fascinated Christians 
for centuries now, millennia even. It was part of the, you know, I, I would say even before there were books out there like Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and movies with Kirk Cameron. I mean, it was part of the original proclamation of the Christian church. That just as Jesus died and rose from the grave and ascended into heaven, someday Jesus is going to come back and finish the work he began, make the kingdom of God complete. Uh, The Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, describes it this way. He says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and all of those who are left will be caught up in the clouds with them. And notice how he ends it, therefore, encourage one another with these words. This, This idea of Jesus coming in, the the parousia, as it's said in Greek, this was, a, this was a, a word of hope and encouragement for the early church. But however, they also recognized that the darkness can sometimes be the greatest before the dawn. And therefore, before Christ comes, there will be darkness upon the earth. And so go forward a few verses in the book of Thessalonians, and Paul says, there will be people saying peace and safety, but destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Pretty dark, right? But that was the idea, is that before Jesus comes, the world gets dark, and it's darkest before the dawn. And you know that first line says, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Paul there is quoting Jesus himself in one of the last sermons he gave when he talked about the end, in which he used that same analogy, the day and the time no one knows, it will come like a thief in the night. This, this sermon was, is, is captured recording in the book of Matthew, and it's three chapters long, from Matthew 23 to Matthew 25. If you look at the book you know, of Matthew as a gospel, it, it's kind of bookended with two great sermons. The first sermon Jesus gives is the one we probably know and love the most, is the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five through seven. But then at the end of Matthew, he gives the Sermon on the End, again, three chapters long, and it roughly breaks into three different parts. He begins in chapter 23 by giving warnings and woes to the Pharisees, warning his disciples, really, don't follow their way of faith. And then after that, in chapter 24, he he has predictions of darkness, predictions. He, He begins by talking about the temple in which they stand, how it's going to fall, which would happen within a generation. But then beyond that, he begins to warn them, not just about the, the, the destruction of the temple, but about the end of time and the dark things that are coming. And, and in, it's in that chapter where you find the thief of the night analogy, chapter 24. And then chapter 25, where we are today, he, he gives three parables of preparation. Now, the second two parables are more familiar. The, 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 right after the one we had today, the second one is the parables of the talents, which we talked about a few weeks ago. And then the parable of the sheep and goats, which has that famous familiar phrase, as you have done for the least of these, so you've done it for me. But before Jesus tells those two stories, the first story he starts with is the story of a wedding and 10 bridesmaids who are waiting for the wedding to begin. Now, let me just pause there and say that the the wedding is a common metaphor for the kingdom of God in Jesus' teaching. And, 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 And Jesus uses this metaphor because Weddings are, are, are moments of joy and celebration and love. It's something you look forward to, anticipate. And so I just want to pause right there and just say the kingdom of God isn't something we should be afraid of. Jesus is second coming. It's something we should look forward to as we do for a wedding. And, and this is the common metaphor that Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride and someday we'll be joined together forever and ever and ever. Now, Jewish weddings in the first century Much like today, there were moments of huge celebration. They took a lot of planning and preparation. But one of the key differences is today, when we're planning a wedding, we send out save the date cards, invitations that give the exact day, time, hour, right? Here's where it's all going to happen. But that wasn't the case in first century weddings. Rather, when, when the day was nearing, the bride would gather to herself her friends, her bridesmaids, her attendants, who would stay with her, and they would await the coming of the groom who would come to their house along with his attendants and his friends. And, and, the, and the exact day and time was not known by anyone except the groom and the groom's father. So the groom arrived in the courtyard with all of his friends. He would ask to see the bride. 
she would come down wearing a veil and he would lift the veil and exclaim his joy upon seeing her. And then the whole party, the couple and all their friends would parade through the town until they got back to the groom's house, at which point the celebration, the, the, the wedding would be consecrated and the celebration and the feasting would begin. That was kind of the, the setting of today's story. Now remember, as I said, the exact day and time, no one exactly knew. And so the brides would come prepared, and one of, or the bridesmaids would come prepared, and one of the things the bridesmaids brought were lamps in case the groom came in the evening. And, and, and the lamps you know, were very simple. They looked kind of like they had a large hole in the middle that you would pour the oil in, and then a small uh, hole where you would put the wick in, and you would keep the wick trimmed so that it could always keep burning. If you, if you let the wick go down too low, it would smoke and go out, right? And so the bridesmaids are, are, are ready and prepared, but here's the twist of the story as Jesus tells it. The groom is delayed. And we don't know what's causing his delay. We simply know that he doesn't arrive when everyone is expecting it. He arrives, in fact, in the middle of the night. By the time the groom comes, the bride and all the bridesmaids have fallen asleep. But then the cry goes out, here comes the groom. <coughs> and all the people you know, suddenly have to get ready. They found that their lamps had gone out, and so they're kind of quickly relighting them, except the problem is that five of the bridesmaids don't have spare oil. Their oil is done. And so they asked the others, can you give us some oil? Ours has gone out. And they said, no, we, we don't have enough to spare either. We, this is all we have. If we share, we won't have enough. You need to go into town and go to the market and try to buy some. And so at that late hour, midnight in the story, the, the foolish bridesmaids have to go out into the market and see what they can find. Meanwhile, while they're looking for the oil, the groom arrives and the celebration begins. The wedding party, even in smaller capacity, begins to process through the town celebrating. They come to the groom's house and they enter into the party and then the gates are shut. And the five bridesmaids who were not ready, were not prepared, didn't have oil, by the time they get to the party, they find a closed gate. And even though they pound and say, we're here, we're here, we're here, they've missed out on the party. Now, that's the way Jesus tells the story. And, and kind of what's interesting about it, you know, for, for New Testament scholars, is that whenever, you know, this metaphor of wedding is most often used, I said it's a common metaphor in the New Testament, usually the church is represented by a single bride that's married to Jesus, you know, in celebration and union forever. But in this story, the church is not represented by a single bride, but by a group of women, 10 women, some of whom are prepared and some of whom are not. And there is a separation that must occur before the wedding begins, a separation between the wise and the foolish, a separation between those who were prepared for the groom to come and those who were not. I had a friend in college. We used to talk about faith issues, you know, a lot. And, and she shared with me one time, she said, the whole idea of heaven freaks me out. She's like, I just can't imagine it. Time that goes on forever and ever and ever. She's doesn't that freak you out too? I mean, that we're just stuck in this endless loop. Like for her, heaven sounded a lot like Groundhog Day. That all you would do is just live time over and over. And she's, wouldn't it get boring? Wouldn't it get monotonous? I mean, how do you keep yourself entertained for eternity? Now, I didn't have the language at that time. I hadn't gone to seminary yet to talk with her about time. But, but, but now that I've had this kind of, you know, this education, I, I, I think I'd say to her now, well, she was thinking about time as chronos time. We talked about this in our second week. Chronos time is, is our experience of time in this life, sequential time. You know, time moves in a river that has past, present, future and, and, and that's kind of our experience of time. But the Greeks had another word for time called kairos. And kairos wasn't about sequential time or measuring time. It was about moments where time seems to stand still. Moments where you almost stand outside of time and you are aware in those moments of how infinite and deep and rich eternity is. And this is the Christian affirmation is that God exists outside of time. 
God created time. He exists outside of time. And, and, and when we die, when time comes to an end for us, we get to go and be with God in that place of eternity. And our experience of time at that point will shift and change. My point is this, is that just as time has a beginning, time will have an end. Hence, the end times. Now, whenever we talk about the, that word, the end, <clears throat> in Greek, the word for end is telos. And telos has kind of a double meaning, just like our English word end does. That when we talk about the end, we could be talking about the final part of something. You know, when you finish reading or telling the story, you, what do you say? The end. This, there's no more parts to the story. You've told it in its completeness. Or when you say, I'm at the end of my rope, or my patience is at an end, you mean, I got no more left. I've reached the end. I have nothing to offer. But sometimes we use the word end not to represent the final part of something, but instead to represent a goal towards which we are striving, you know, something that we are moving towards. And so we talk about the end justifying the means, or we put in lots of energy and effort, but it's not just random, it's, it's directed sword towards some end, a finish line that we hope to reach. Does that make sense? So end can have one of two meanings. So when we talk about the end of time, we mean both these things that there will come a point for all of us where our experience of time will end, where it'll be time's up, we, we, no more time given to us. But we also, when we talk about the end of time, we're also talking and affirming that there is a goal towards which time is moving. And the Christian affirmation is that the end of time towards which we are moving is a kingdom of love and grace and peace, an experience of blessing unlike we've ever known in this life. So when we talk about the end of time, we have this paradoxical Christian affirmation that the end of time is the experience of a love that will never end. The goal to which we are moving is the experience of a love and grace that will never run out. So then we take that back into our understanding of, of, of where we live right now. That we live somewhere between here and eternity. We live in the space in between. We live in what scholars call the already not yet kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has already come, Jesus proclaimed. He didn't say it's going to come someday. When Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is here. It's among us right now. And wherever someone experiences healing and grace and new life in Jesus' name, whenever acts of kindness and justice and mercy are done, in those moments we can affirm the kingdom of God is right here among us right now. It's already here. But there's also a profound sense in which the kingdom of God is not yet. Because we live in a world where there's a lot of darkness and suffering. I and mean, we live in a world where we're constantly looking and asking, is this the end time? And so we live in this tension between the kingdom of God being already here, but not yet. And Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as a way of recognizing the kingdom of God has not yet fully come, and so we pray it into being and we live our lives towards that not yet kingdom for which we eagerly await. The Apostle Paul said that, that all of creation is groaning in anticipation for the new creation to come among us. And so we live in this in-between space, hoping for what we have not yet seen, but living faithfully in the here and now. And when Jesus gave this last sermon to his disciples, he was telling them, look, life is going to require of you constant vigilance and faithfulness to always be ready. And sometimes this life will involve even hard suffering. 
that we can trust when we experience suffering, it will have an end. And when I say that it'll have an end, I mean it in both senses of the word. It'll have an ending point. This too shall pass. It won't last forever. But it also has an end in that it has a goal. It is producing something within us. Romans chapter 5, Paul affirms, we know that suffering isn't pointless. It produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We can trust that even when we experience suffering, it's not pointless. It's producing something in us that the end result is God's love and hope being poured into our hearts. Our lives are directed towards that end for which God has intended us. So let me go back to our story, okay? You have five bridesmaids who miss out on the party. And why do they miss out on the party? Because they don't have oil in their lamp. So what's the oil symbolize? If you go back to the Old Testament, Oil is a symbol of blessing and peace and unity. In a couple different places, it is used to represent the the, the life of a person who lives Torah life, who lives a life of good deeds, obedient to God's law. That's a well-oiled life. Or even if you go into the New Testament, oil, and especially in a lamp, Jesus says you are the light of the world. And even in the same chapter, chapter 25, he says, this is what a well-oiled life looks like. I was thirsty. I was hungry, and you gave me some food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. This is the well-oiled life, the well-prepared life that Jesus is looking for. And so... Jesus summarizes his parable. He says, therefore I tell you, keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of the groom's coming. Now this word, keep watch, it's kind of interesting. It's Gregorio in Greek, and it literally means stay awake. You know, stay awake, don't fall asleep, because you don't know when, when the bridegroom is coming. The reason it's curious to me is because all 10 not just five, all 10 fell asleep. But Jesus doesn't judge them for falling asleep. He judges them for not having oil, for not being prepared. And so scholars suggest that the word Gregoria doesn't just mean stay awake, it also means be prepared. Always be ready. And to me this means that the point for us is that when we think about the end times, we don't think about the end times because we're always watching and predicting. The end is coming, the end is coming, the end is near. It's not about watching for an end, but rather living towards an end. Does that make sense? It's, it's not about watching for when all, you know, everything's going to crumble, but rather living towards a good and purposeful end for each and every one of our lives. When I was at St. Luke's, um, I taught a class called Letters from Dad. It's a very simple class. I enjoyed teaching it. It was just basically you called a bunch of guys together, and we all wrote letters together. And we, and we set goals for who we were going to write letters to, to our kids, to our spouses, our parents, um, grandkids. I mean, every, every single person would make a goal for how many letters they wanted to write. And then we would simply meet together to hold each other accountable and to process, you know, what, what we wanted to say. And, 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 and sometimes we do exercises together. They were kind of meant to, you know, prime the pump and get people's creative juices flowing just to put pen to paper. And the last class, the last exercise we did was this. We would turn the lights down real low. And then we would read a story, a true story, about a mine that collapsed, trapping eight miners inside. And these eight men were running out of oxygen, and when it became apparent to them that they were not going to be rescued, they made the decision to pull out paper and pen and use what time they had left to write, to write notes to each member of their family. And then we would turn the lights back up, 
And we would say to the men who are gathered in the study, we would say, okay, imagine you are at the end and you have this one letter to write to your friends or your family. What words do you want to give them? And I remember doing that exercise the first time myself. And the word that came to me was present. That I wanted more than anything else for my kids to know I was present. I, I, I hope that they looked back on our lives and said, Dad was there for every game and activity, play, performance, school you know, event, Dad was present. That dad was present in the evenings, and not just present like physically, but also present emotionally and, 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 you know, relationally with us. And as I kind of reflected on that word present, that that's really the word I hope they would hang on to, I, I realized that at the time, that word did not reflect the reality of my life. I was living 100 miles an hour. I was at the church for studies and meetings five nights out of the week. I was so far from being present. And I knew if I wanted to make that my end, it had to change my present, how I lived in the moment here and now. I think all of us, when we get to the end, we would like to hear the words that Jesus said also in Matthew 25, well done thy good and faithful servant. Come and share thy master's joy and happiness. We would all love to hear those words. That's the end that we want to re- arrive at. But to arrive at that end, it means in the here and now, we have to keep our lamps burning. And to that end, I encourage you to count your days so that each and every single one of them counts. I encourage you to pay attention to every moment God's given you and, and to recognize and ask, what, what do you, God, how do I respond to this moment? What are you asking of me in return? And I encourage you to create a margin, a margin that protects and restores your soul so that when we get to the end, when you get to the end, you're You're not burned out and bitter, but instead filled with joy and love and thanksgiving. Remember the end towards which we are going, because pointing our lives towards that end shapes and changes the way we experience time in the here and now.